Okay, we're in Genesis chapter 6, and we'll begin reading a little bit. I wanted us to, to look at this and, and do this a little bit later on. We're going to be looking at a, a, a video that I think will be valuable. Uh, it says, Now it came about that when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Um, here you have kind of an interesting thing. You've got sons of God and daughters of men. Uh, we've already been introduced a little bit to Cain and his family, and then we were introduced a little bit to Seth and his family. And we could see that various groups went different directions. And there were some that called upon the name of the Lord, uh, these would be thought of. Now, when we talk about sons of God, I know that there is a statement among some uh, that regard the sons of God as angels because the sons of God uh, met together in the book of Job in the first chapter. You know, they were there, they were walking through. And sometimes people think that these angelic beings uh, had sex with women on earth. And that's what caused the Nephilim, the giants. But that is an old myth. It is not the case. The sons of God here is talking about people who were faithful. And the daughters of men would be people who were unfaithful. Now, you had uh, the sons of... Uh, the, the you, you had some who were the sons of men and some who were daughters who were uh, sons of God that also think. It's just, this is just a figure of speech saying there's some good folks that began to mix with the bad folks. And they began to multiply. And uh, unfortunately, uh, that was not always a good thing. You began to see that sin began to multiply, especially because of the way people were doing. In verse 3, the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. And of course, that weakness is there. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. So from there came that point in time when people were not going to live that 900 years like they did before. And it says the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. Now, Nephilim, uh, whenever this particular word is used uh, a little bit later on, uh, over in the book of uh, Later on, it's, it's talking about people who were giants. And that's really what the, he's talking about here. They were, they were giants. They were men of renown. Uh, they were walking on the earth. They were warlike. Uh, here you have a situation where this is where people hating one another really gets into it. You know, you, you can imagine uh, the children of Cain, knowing that Cain was punished because of what he did to Abel. Abel didn't have any kids, but Seth had kids. And Seth was the replacement of Abel. So you had this kind of sibling rivalry from way back. And when you have those kinds of things happening, uh, it's kind of, it kind of passed on from generation to generation. And sometimes in those later generations, it gets worse. Uh, you can have a Hatfield, a Hatfield and McCoy situation real quick whenever you have somebody gets mad and, and uh, you get a few years down the road and people will do ugly, terrible things to one another and they don't even know why. And so you had some giants. Uh, but let's dispense with the idea that the sons of God, and I, I, know, what, uh, I know what Job said, but the reasons why it would not be uh, some angelic being is you remember in Matthew 22, whenever Jesus is having a conversation with, um, uh, with the Sadducees and the Pharisees, one of the things that he mentions about the angels that they neither marry or given in marriage. Angels don't reproduce. There's no reason for an angel to reproduce. Uh, Two things about angels. One is they don't reproduce, and every angel that's ever spoken about in the scriptures is always male, and everyone on the Christmas tree is a female, and I've never understood that. And that's, 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 
Now, you have to understand, I am a man who's been swimming in estrogen for a long, long time. <laughs> With four daughters, 11 granddaughters, and one grandson. And it's not that I'm against women. I'm not. It just, to me, always been interesting that uh, it's that way. It's interesting that uh, I was in Russia a number of years ago, and a Russian Orthodox priest came to me. In Russian, uh, the word for sheep is feminine, and the word for goat is masculine. And he asked me, and he was as serious as he could be, does that mean that all men are going to be lost and all women are going to be saved? And that's, that was exactly what he asked me, and he was serious. Now, he didn't have, he may have been a Russian Orthodox priest, but he didn't have a lot of education from the standpoint of the original language. Well, I had my Greek New Testament with me, and I opened it up, and I showed him which was the word for goat. And I said it was masculine, but it could be either masculine or feminine. And I showed him the word sheep, and it was masculine, but it could be either masculine or feminine. And so it didn't, that, that was not the way it was in the original language is what I was saying to him. He was so relieved. He really was. He really was. And uh, I, that was one of the most interesting questions I'd ever had in my whole life. But you have these kinds of things where people get an idea in their head and it begins to spread. And uh, even though the sons of God and the book of Job are spoken of as being angelic beings, the context of this is talking about the people who were on earth because everything that is said in this chapter is not about angels, but it's about what's happened on the earth. It's what happened with flesh. Okay. We've already seen that. And I just, I just wanted to do that because you'll be asked that question at some point or another. And so the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, and those were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. Well, apparently they had uh, gotten to be warrior-like and had uh, uh, established a great reputation. But it, maybe it was a reputation defending or maybe it was a reputation attacking. But uh, Nephilim is a word which later on in Scripture uh, has the idea of, uh, of giant. Numbers 13 and verse 33 is the only other time when the word Nephilim is used. And uh, in that passage, uh, it says there also, we saw the Nephilim, that is the sons of Anak, are part of the Nephilim. And we became like grasshoppers in our sight, and so we were in their sight. So that word is, is referred to as giants. And uh, I think this is a, a good way to, to recall it. Uh, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth. Well, you can imagine if they've been fighting anger and all of those bad uh, ideas were among them. But look at this part, that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Uh, I think that probably would be a good comment about some people in our nation today, there are some folks that just are evil and they do bad things. And I hate that. It's, and the Lord must have been very disappointed because it says the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. Now see, this is not talking about angels in heaven. This is talking about man on the earth. And he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. Now, uh, sin has always been something that God, evil has always been something that God just did not like. We should never think that evil and sin is trivial. Yes, Carl? Generation going up the north to Adam, but I don't think I'm Ten, ten generations. In fact, that's one of the things that we'll look at here in just a little bit. Terah was number nine, and Noah would be ten. And there'll be we'll find out that there's ten generations from Noah to Abraham. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. It was. 
uh, how many generations there were after Cain. Could be a few more, maybe 11 or 12. It's hard to know. But you've got a lot of situations where you've got that many generations, you could have thousands of people already. And enough for them to have battles and all kinds of things and, and uh, that kind of thing. But he was sorry that he had made man. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things. I'm glad you asked that question, and I want to address it just a little bit closer. You know, sometimes I will hear people say, well, in the book of Genesis, you've got a father and the son of, doesn't necessarily mean he was the direct son of, just that he was a son of, it could be a grandson or grandson. But let me mention that the dates are the same, whether even if it is a grandson, there was only so many years between the father and the son. So the genealogy, the dating of the genealogy is accurate. Even if that's a grandson, you know, I only have one grandson. And there's a lot of years between me and him, and uh, comparatively. But uh, whenever you think about it, uh, if you count that, that's still accurate between those two numbers. So whenever we look back, how far was Adam back, then that is, is there. Uh, some people want to make some of these stretches a long stretch, is what I'm saying. That, But you have numbers that are given. We would not have any genealogy if it were not for the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis and these numbers, while they are tedious, are very, very important from the standpoint of giving us some exact details. And isn't it interesting that Genesis will give these numbers in ways that you don't find in later books of the Old Testament? You don't, you don't hear how old a king was before a king had a son and how old he was. You don't have that, but you do in Genesis. And I thought that was quite an interesting thing. And, of course, uh, we began to see some of these same things a little bit later on. But after a while, they, they stopped counting the number of years between the father and the son. But here, they're counted. I just wanted to point that out. Uh, if, if it was a grandson, that doesn't change the number of years between that father and that son. But there are only 10 people listed between Adam and Noah. And I, I really think that those are actual sons, not grandsons. I think this was because that's the way it, it seems to appear in the text. It seems like there's about 100 years average yes. before each one had its size. So yeah. would it be safe to say? been at least a thousand years from Adam? Yeah. Um, or is that Adam, uh, I was trying to remember, and I think I may have some of this a little bit later on. I was trying to remember exactly how long it was. Adam had not been dead for a terribly long time. Uh, you have Methuselah being born, and Methuselah died the year of the flood, but now Noah, let's remember Noah and Methuselah uh, was quite old. He was what grandfather? Uh, he was 969 years old, the year of the flood. But uh, you go back and, and you start counting it back. There's not that many years. I, I think I had a, uh, I think I had something that was back a little earlier where I was talking about the length of time between certain things. It wasn't a terribly long time. If you're talking about the flood, the flood would have happened. Uh, well, let's look back and see what was on. There was one of them that... Uh, we had looked at, I'll have to, maybe it was back at the, uh, uh, yes. Now, here you have a situation of the age whenever they had the child and the age that they were when they died. And you'll notice that it's much, much shorter, and you've got Tira living only to 205 years. And Abraham, what was it uh, he lived to? Uh, it was 180 years. I'm, 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 I think he lived to be 180 because uh, he had a lot of kids after he had, after he had uh, Isaac. He had another 12 kids, so he was given a little longer life. But, uh, no, there was something a little bit earlier that uh, had, a, had a list that had the, the dates on it that did that. But there was 10 generations. Uh, now, if you look way up there at Methuselah, where he was, 
And man, that's a long way from Tira. Long way from there. Lamech, Noah. Uh, he was grandfather of Noah. But uh, you've got a, you've got a, a, you don't really have that much time involved. Okay, the Lord was sorry, and so he blotted man, uh, that he made man, he blotted them out. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And of course, we looked at chapter five toward those last two verses and how that uh, Noah would be someone that would bring favor and would bring, bring uh, peace and would bring, bring a change, uh, remove that, that curse, uh, some of those kinds of things. And he says, these are the record, records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. He was blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And it says, verse 11, the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. Now, you had these big warriors, the Nephilim, the giants, and they were men of renown, but they were also men of violence. God uh, hates violence. God hates war. Uh, God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. And then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh. Now, do you notice that he talks about all? All of these statements are talking about that something that was a global destruction and not just simply uh, a, small, a small matter. Now, uh, there weren't as many people on the whole earth, but the whole earth was going to suffer because of it. I really believe that uh, if you look at uh, some of the things that are found in, uh, uh, in there's a group called uh, uh, the Genesis thing and the Genesis flood, there's a, a lot of things that have come out in recent years that have talked about was it real. Uh, a lot of the things that took place on this earth where you have this, the separating of the continents and a lot of dramatic challenges came about in the flood. A lot of things were, were buried in the flood. And sometimes people think, oh, this is millions of years old. Well, no, the flood may have been what brought a lot of that to, to bear. And so um, uh, it's something that everyone is going to have a, a problem with. And we'll look at that a little bit whenever we look at these videos in just a little bit. But the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I'm about to destroy them with the earth. And so he says, make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. And you shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits. 300 cubits would be 450. Uh, 50 cubits would be 75 feet, 450 feet, 75 feet. And then he talks about its breadth would be 50, and its height, 30 cubits, that would be 45 feet high. Uh, you shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top. This would be a window that would go all the way around, not just one little window, you know, that opens up like you have in some of the children's picture book. Uh, set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with lower and second and third decks. He says, behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood. God's in charge here. God's doing this. A flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life. From under heaven, everything that is on the earth shall perish. Now, that's a pretty big statement. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female of the birds after their kind and of the animals after their kind. Now, a kind is not every little species. He didn't bring 200 dogs in. He brought two. The species of dogs came from those dogs that were on the ark. And the uh, many of those species, a dog is a dog. And there were many species that came. Sometimes we think a breed this, a breed that, a hundred breeds of dogs. Well, all those breeds came through 
the propagation over time. It wasn't uh, that there were 400 dogs on the ark. It was only two. And all of those dogs came from those two that were there. Sometimes we get confused about those kinds of things. Uh, but the word kind is more like the word genus, not the word species. Uh, and he'll come to you. They will come to you and you keep them alive. As for you, take for yourself some of all the food which is edible and gather it to yourself and it shall be for food for you and for them. Look at verse 22. Thus Noah did. Noah did just what he was told to do. He did just what he was told to do. This, again, is something that is the beginning of this kind of thing of being careful, being diligent, doing what God said just the way God said to do it. And he, according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. Those are very specific terms about how Noah obeyed God. And they set a good uh, example for us. Yes, Carl. God always had the same place. This is the first same place that God put his people. Yes, he did. And and it was a it was a good situation for what he did. Uh, we have two videos that I want us to see, and this is done by a fellow named Branyan May, and it was produced by World Video Bible School, which is found in Buda, Texas, B U D A, Buda, Texas. Uh, Branyan is a friend of mine. He's a member of the church, very faithful. He attends the Southwest Church of Christ in Austin, Texas, and just a good, good fellow. And anyway, let's go ahead and let's do the one on that first one on the ark, and then we'll do the one on the animals. We probably have time for the one on the ark, and then we'll take a break and do the other one later. But I think you'll find quite a bit of good information on these two videos. There are actually four videos from your sister. We're only going to look at the two of them. That's on This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. When you think about the reality of Noah's Ark, you might have questions about its size, its construction, or its cargo. Because you've probably seen the pictures like I have of a quaint little boat and an old pudgy man and a handful of animals packed inside. We show these pictures to our children in books and in video. But what was Noah's Ark really like? Did Noah and his sons really build the Ark? And did they really live on it with all those animals for months? And how about the big question? How large was the Ark? I mean, how long, how tall, how wide? Well, on these questions, we don't have to be left wondering. In the Bible, God gives precise measurements to Noah for exactly how big the ark should be. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. And there you are. In God's instructions are the very precise measurements for the ark. But you might be wondering, well, what's a cubit? We don't use the cubit as a modern unit of measurement. But in the ancient world, the cubit simply referred to the length of a man's forearm from the elbow to the fingertip, roughly 18 inches. And being such a practical form of measurement, it was likely the most common unit of length in the ancient civilizations, such as the Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Egyptian, and the Hebrew. Now, with the understanding that one cubit is 18 inches or a foot and a half, how big was the ark? In order to help us visualize what these dimensions mean, I am standing here next to the only full-scale, floating, modern-day replica of Noah's Ark, built based on the Bible specifications. The Ark is 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet tall. Inside, there are three decks, 
Each deck has over 30,000 square feet, which means that the Ark has a total of over 100,000 square feet. Its volume is equivalent to 1.5 million cubic feet, or approximately 17 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Now, while some of the specific construction details of this modern replica may be different from the actual Ark that Noah built, what this modern-day representation does provide is an astounding perspective of the actual dimensions and scale of Noah's Ark. Let's take this monumental structure and explore its size. Let's first try to put the Ark's length, 450 feet, in perspective. A convenient comparison is to think about some popular modern sporting venues. Take, for example, an American football field. The length of the arc is equivalent to the length of one and a quarter of these fields, measuring from goalpost to goalpost. Or if you're a baseball fan sitting in Yankee Stadium in New York on the front row behind home plate, the 450 foot arc very nearly matches the distance from your seat to the farthest wall out in center field. Or maybe cricket is your game and you're watching a test match from the grandstand at the historic Lord's Cricket Grounds in St. John's Wood, London. The Ark would fill the link across the widest portion of the field. Let's consider the Ark's link compared to some famous historical structures across the world. Imagine the Ark being stood on its end in a vertical fashion. And let's compare it first to the famous Leaning Tower of Pisa in Italy. Completed in the 14th century AD, it stands 183 feet tall and has a diameter of 49 feet. If we now move to the country of China and allow D pagoda, completed in the 11th century AD, this pagoda stands 276 feet tall. Made of brick and stone, it is the tallest existing pre-modern pagoda in China. The two towers in Bologna, Italy, were completed in the early 12th century AD. These towers served as the inspiration for the architect Manuro Yamasaki, who designed the former World Trade Center towers in New York. The tallest of the two towers, the Asinelli Tower, stands 318 feet tall. Moving now to England, we find the Elizabeth Tower and its clock known as Big Ben, arguably one of the most recognizable clock towers in the world. It was completed in 1859 and stands 316 feet tall and has a 50-foot square base. Across the Atlantic in the United States, the famous Statue of Liberty, dedicated in 1886, stands 305 feet tall from the ground to Lady Liberty's torch. The Cathedral of Antwerp in Belgium has a spire completed in the 16th century, extending 404 feet high. In Washington, D.C., the Washington Monument is the tallest true obelisk in the world. Its pyramid-shaped capstone was placed in 1884 at a height of 555 feet. It has a square base of 55 feet on its sides. Only five years after the Washington Monument was completed, the Eiffel Tower in Paris was finished, standing an amazing 986 feet tall and was the tallest structure in the world for over 40 years. Now, the last two structures to show for comparison are ancient structures built thousands of years ago and were listed among the seven wonders of the ancient world by Antipater of Sidon and Herodotus. The Lighthouse of Alexandria is known from both ancient writings and from underwater archaeological excavations. Approximately 400 feet tall, it was constructed in the 3rd century BC by Ptolemy I. It stood for 1,700 years until its structure was ruined by earthquakes. A replica now stands in Shangsha, China. The Great Pyramid of Giza stands 455 feet tall. It represents one of the most ancient existing structures in all the world. It was the tallest known structure in the world for over 3,000 years. These comparisons can provide a relative sense of the length of the arc, which is quite long, but not unreasonable or surpassing our comprehension. 
Now let's consider the area marked out by the ark and the amount of deck space that the ark would provide. According to Genesis 6.16, the ark was divided into three decks, lower, second, and third. So if Noah were to make a visual inspection around all three decks, he would have to walk about six-tenths of a mile. If we now take our length and our width for each deck, we can calculate the square footage to be 33,750 square feet per deck, which means that the entire arc had a total of 101,250 square feet. Going back to our common sports comparisons, the arc would have had the same approximate area as two American football fields or 21 basketball courts. So we've discussed the length of the arc and the area included in the decks. But before we calculate its total internal volume, let's consider the end dimensions. 75 feet wide by 45 feet tall. These cross-sectional dimensions very nearly match the wingspan and the tail height of NASA's space shuttle. So if you were to open the end of the arc and begin loading in the shuttles, you would be able to load in the shuttle Atlantis, then the space shuttle Discovery, then the shuttle Enterprise, and then the shuttle Endeavour would nearly fit up until its engines. So almost four NASA space shuttles would fit within the volume of the ARC. Now in terms of transporting cargo, the ARC's immense volume would be equivalent to carrying 527 railroad boxcars. Or when calculated, it comes out to be over 1.5 million cubic feet of internal space. Oftentimes, there are wild misconceptions about Noah's Ark. One of the first says that Noah's Ark is the largest floating vessel to have ever been built. This is simply not true. Though it was the largest vessel at its time in history, there have been many ships built in the millennia afterward that have been comparable and even greater in size. Now, this should not discredit or lessen the Ark's extremely significant place in history. But instead, it should bring into our view an accurate reality for the biblical proportions of Noah's Ark. Let's look at a few well-known historical ships to compare with Noah's Ark. Let's start with the Santa Maria, part of the trio of ships sailed by Christopher Columbus in the late 15th century AD to cross the Atlantic Ocean to the Americas. It was approximately 60 feet long and carried a crew of approximately 40 men. At 227 feet, the HMS Victory is one of England's most well-known wooden warships. It is the oldest naval ship still commissioned, having seen action in the Napoleonic Wars. It is now dry docked in Portsmouth, England as a museum ship. The early 20th century in the United States saw some of the last wooden sailing vessels built. At 330 feet long, the Wyoming was one of only a few six-masted schooners to be built. The Wyoming sailed the eastern coast of the United States from 1909 to 1924. King Sneferus' boats, referenced on the ancient Palermo stone. If we now look back in the annals of history, we find ancient Egyptian inscriptions on this stone of a 100 cubit, that's a 150 foot wooden ship that was part of the fourth dynasty fleet of King Sneferu, a matter of only hundreds of years after the flood. Later, during Egypt's 18th dynasty, a barge, possibly in excess of 200 feet, known as Hatshepsut's barge, was constructed to transport large obelisks along the Nile. In the early years of the Roman Empire, Emperor Caligula had numerous large ships. One called the Giant Ship is recorded to be 340 feet long, possibly served as a barge to transport large structures from Egypt back to Rome. In the early 15th century AD, the Ming dynasty established itself as a naval power. They constructed a large fleet of wooden ships, the largest in the range from 300 to 400 feet long. The ships were known as treasure ships and were used on numerous voyages to enhance the Ming's tributary system. The Zahir One is a modern vessel designed as a livestock carrier. At 393 feet long and 69 feet wide, its deck space is only slightly less than Noah's Ark. And it is currently sailing the oceans, carrying thousands of animals between the international markets of Australia, South America, Middle East, and other. 
In particular, skeptics of the Ark have pointed specifically to the Wyoming schooner as representing the upper limit to the size of a wooden vessel. However, this criticism fails on two levels. First, there are documented historical wooden vessels at and surpassing the 300-foot limit. Secondly, the Wyoming schooner sailed and performed its duties for over 14 years, while the Ark only needed to operate for one year's time. Now, in the last 150 years, advancements in the construction of metal ships and ocean liners has seen the production of enormous vessels like the Great Eastern, the Titanic, the Queen Mary, and any number of modern day cruise ships. These ships have become essentially floating cities with thousands of travelers, crew, and a multitude of onboard destinations. However, in terms of wooden ships, the Ark does rank among the largest in history. This has led some to claim that even though the Ark's size is not unreasonable, it was still too advanced a vessel for Noah to build because he would have needed understanding of physics, calculus, structural analysis, and naval engineering to have designed and built such a vessel. This perspective, however, suffers from several misconceptions. First, it assumes that Noah himself was the originator for the ark's scale and design. But according to the Bible, this is not the case. It was God who initiated and conveyed the ark's plans. Noah was given divine direction and instruction and then expected to contribute his labor in carrying out the task. Second, there is often an overarching misunderstanding that says, well, hasn't man had a long evolutionary history with a gradual growth of both intellectual and physical capacities? This concept of a gradual evolutionary ascent for man is contrary to the biblical concept of man's origin and it unnecessarily confuses the actual time frame for the early accounts of Genesis. The accounts of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Enoch, Methuselah, and Noah were not tens of thousands of years ago, let alone millions. Noah did not live at a time of club-carrying, cave-dwelling Stone Age men who lacked the abilities of fire, agriculture, or linguistics. According to the Bible's account of creation, mankind was created and endowed with reasonable faculties including communication, socialization, critical thinking, and ingenuity. So in what time period did Noah live? Well, let's consider a basic historical timeline to give us a context. Based on both biblical and secular history, the time from today back to the life of Jesus is approximately 2,000 years. From the time of Jesus in the first century AD back to the patriarch Abraham, is again about 2,000 years, based on the genealogies of New Testament and the corroboration of secular history. Now, from Abraham back to Noah and the ark can be approximated to be on the order of hundreds of years. And from Noah back to the first created couple, Adam and Eve, was a little over 1,600 years. Thus, we can see that the timeline of the flood and Noah's life was between four to 5,000 years ago. In secular history terms, the general description for this time period, four to 5,000 years, is the Bronze Age, which gains this name from the copper and bronze tools that were being used. Biblical history concurs with this general naming convention because it specifically speaks of a descendant of Cain named Tubal Cain, who was a relative contemporary of Noah, and who the Bible says was an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. Recognizing that Noah lived during the aptly named Bronze Age provides a good historical setting and helps us recognize what types of materials and resources Noah had access to use. First and foremost, God's instructions for the design of the ark clearly define the primary building material, wood, and Noah needed lots of it. Noah would have had to gather wood for a large variety of structural purposes. Large, load-bearing beams for the primary framing of the ark's structure. Lumber that would form the exterior of the ark. Lumber for the rooms or nests. Various pins, corrals, cages. Decking lumber for internal flooring of the lower, second, and third decks. Since there would be only one door to enter, internal ramps or stairs would provide a means to move between decks. Now, a subtle yet important aspect is that for all of the construction and obvious woodworking, Noah would have needed a good number and variety of tools. So what types of tools would have existed in his day? 
We've already established that even in terms of secular and biblical history, Noah, Noah lived in the so-called Bronze Age, meaning the use of copper smelting and alloys. But let's also consider some additional biblical references to various vocations that were in existence even prior to Noah. Farming and agriculture has existed since the very creation of man in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were given the original directive to tend and keep it. And after their sin and subsequent removal from the garden, Adam was to till the ground. Reasonably then, Adam's oldest son, Cain, was also called a tiller of the ground. What this means is that prior to Noah, for over 1,000 years, mankind had worked, tilled, and cultivated crops. Though we don't know specifics, 1,000 years is a long time to develop processes and tools to carry out your trade. We also see within the first family the vocation of cattle raising and shepherding. Adam's second son, Abel, was described as a keeper of sheep, and we find him in Genesis 4 bringing the first fruits of his flocks as a sacrifice to God. We know the skill of tending flocks and raising cattle continued throughout subsequent generations because we read of Cain's descendant, Jabel, being described as the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. Jabel had two other brothers, Jubal and Tubal Cain who provided for us a glimpse of some other unique and skilled vocations. The Bible describes Jubal as the father of all those who play the harp and flute. The production of musical instruments, such as stringed instruments and wind instruments, requires precision, both in craftsmanship and tooling. The Bible describes Tubal Cain as an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. Metalworking and blacksmithing represent very important and applicable trades to the construction efforts in which Noah would be engaging. Considering Noah's historical context and these various occupations that are known to have existed, it's reasonable to consider that Noah had many potential metal tools and implements at his disposal. Likely heavy tools like axes, hammers, mallets, pry bars, and maybe some forms of woodcutting saws. Considering the reference to musical instruments, like harps and flutes, there may have been light-duty tools like punches, chisels, or clamps. Though the primary structure of the ark was wood, various metal fasteners might have been used by carpenters and woodworkers, such as nails and spikes, strappings and bracings. One final comparison to consider that provides great insight into the potential capabilities that existed during the Bronze Age and for mankind's ingenuity in general, is the Great Pyramid of Giza. As the only surviving member of the original Seven Wonders of the Ancient World, the Great Pyramid stands as an amazing example of mankind's capabilities. Though it was not the very first pyramid built, the Great Pyramid is one of the earlier known and represents a man-made structure completed within a span of only hundreds to a thousand years after the time of the Flood. Having the plans, the materials, and the tools is sufficient to start a task, but some question whether Noah had the time or ability to complete the ark. If we look back for one moment to our discussion of the Great Pyramid of Giza, its massive stone structure actually encompasses a volume over 50 times that of the ark. It's estimated that there are approximately 2.3 million stone blocks, each weighing an average of two and a half tons. The blocks were cut and transported from numerous quarries, some nearby and some many miles away. They were then moved, raised, and precisely installed into place. When we consider the ark, the wood composition would have been far easier to gather, cut, and install than the stone blocks of the pyramid. Although the specific details of Noah's day-to-day -day construction are not recorded for us in the Bible, it does describe the general requirements given to Noah and the final results of the ark saving all that was on board. Thus Noah did, according to all that God commanded him, so he did. For the construction, there are numerous reasonable options that would have aided Noah. First, the time frame. Noah had to complete the task is usually referred to as being in the range of 100 years. We gauge this from Noah being 500 years old, when he and his wife began to have their sons in Genesis chapter 5. And then the flood came when he was 600 years old in Genesis chapter 7. 
And 100 years is a long time to work on any project. Second, could Noah have had help? Since Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives were all ultimately saved on the ark, it's usually understood that they were all involved in the preparation process. But in addition, Noah's father, Lamech, and grandfather, Methuselah, were alive until just prior to the time of the flood. And each of these patriarchs had other sons and daughters. Could Noah's father, grandfather, uncles, or other family have helped? Or could Noah have hired laborers, even skilled laborers, from nearby communities and cities? Potentially. Third, in regards to even gathering the materials, the known vocations of farming, shepherding, and blacksmithing probably depended on other existing trades and services, like marketplaces, to sell and trade goods, woodworking and carpentry, mining of ores for smelting. Even during Cain's life, we read of him building a city and calling it after his son, Enoch. Could Noah have purchased, traded, or bartered for needed lumber and materials? Assuming a 10-hour workday, there are over 3,650 working hours per year, which means that Noah had 365,000 working hours in his 100-year time span. If we then multiply this by four, considering Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, then there were nearly 1.5 million man hours. If we add Noah's wife and the wives of his sons, then there were over 2.5 million working hours to gather materials, construct, and prepare the internal dwellings. This modern day replica of Noah's Ark was built within 20,000 man hours. Of course, there were many modern day technologies and resources utilized, but Noah had 125 times this amount of time only accounting for the time his family would contribute. The Bible's account of the structure and size of Noah's Ark places it as a perfectly sufficient vessel for its unique task. Its massive size has established its important purpose throughout history. Yet in the context of various historical structures and boats, the Ark's dimensions are not unreasonable to have been completed using the materials God instructed in the time God provided with the resources Noah had available. We get into the next uh, uh, the next video that we'll look at here in just a little bit on page forty seven. It talks about Noah's flood, a historical global catastrophe. And uh, this, this particular thing comes from answers in Genesis. That's the people that built the ark. And um, uh, Dr. Terry Mortensen writes up quite an, an interesting thing. Uh, he talks about on page 48, Noah's flood really happened in history. And of course, he gives biblical things and some other aspects. Noah's flood was global and not localized. Uh, he talks about the volume of the ark and many other things that are there. Uh, Noah's flood was catastrophic. Uh, and of course, he was going to blot out all the creatures of the earth, uh, the source of the waters from the deep and also from the sky, uh, the rising of the waters, how high they got, the movement of the waters. We'll look at some of these things in a little bit. The dimensions of the ark, uh, the location of the Garden of Eden, uh, cannot be harmonized with the geography of the post-flood Mesopotamian Valley. Uh, so there are some things that changed. The flood changed an awful lot of things. Uh, I think the continents were more, far more defined by the flood uh, after the flood than what we, what we see now in the continents are different than probably what would have been at that time. And of course, that was the point that he'll make when we talk about the animals in a little bit. And so there is a lot of stuff here, and there's quite a number of footnotes. I thought of the, uh, of the things that I wanted to present, this in written form you can take and look at a little bit later. But I thought it was quite an interesting little thing. And, and again, I wanted to make this study of these first 11 chapters more apologetic than, than just necessarily a commentary. But, of course, the more you find out about the text, there are things in the text, little bitty things, that sometimes you overlook in telling uh, what's there.
And these are things that are important. Everything that is in God's word was put there for purpose. Put there for purpose. I was rooting for Georgia. <laughs> I, I'll hush. I have a, I have a brother-in-law who lives north of here and uh, up nearly in the line on the line and to the north up in the mountains and and uh, he's a big Georgia fan and I was rooting for Georgia. So yeah, I did. Okay, let's go ahead and look at the one with the animals. We'll we'll look at that. This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. When considering the reality of Noah's Ark, you've probably heard some of the skeptical questions. Like, how did Noah and his small family find and trap the animals? Then how did they transport them and house them all back on the ark? Because aren't there hundreds of millions of animal species existing on the earth? Or maybe you've heard the question, how can Noah have traveled all the way down to Australia to catch two koalas, then across to North America to trap two grizzly bears, and then down to frozen Antarctica to fetch two penguins? Though these questions are common, here is the problem. The scenario described is entirely false, and it's based on misrepresentations of both the scientific and the biblical records. For some, the presentation of this scenario is an attempt to cast an air of ridiculousness on the biblical account by placing the huge burden on Noah to travel the world, to trap and transport millions upon millions of animals back to the ark. In studying the reality of the ark and its animals, we have to first base our understanding on the Bible's account. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female of the birds after their kind of animals after their kind and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. Two of every kind will come to you. The first fallacy in the skeptic scenario is that Noah did not have to worry about where to travel, what animals to trap, how to determine male and female of each species, or how to transport each of them back to the ark. The traveling was accomplished by the animals under the direction of their creator. Whatever the geography of Earth's land masses was prior to the flood, and such a cataclysmic event, the topography was different. Noah didn't have to travel to a distant region in the south to bring back kangaroos, or to a far-off region in the east to bring back pandas, or he didn't need to trek through some northern wilderness to bring back a host of different bird kinds. Rather, he was to prepare the ark for their shelter, the internal compartments for their dwellings, and the stores of food for survival. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And you shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. The second fallacy in the skeptic's argument involves the enormous misrepresentation of the number of animals that Noah would have needed to take. While some skeptics have stated that there were hundreds of millions of species that existed, Others have gone so far as to say that the fossil record documents a half billion species or more. Both of these numbers are absolutely false and demonstrate both a misrepresentation of solid scientific data and a misunderstanding of the biblical time frame. The biblical history leading back to Noah's life did not take place over hundreds of thousands or even millions of years ago, but only a few thousand years. And scientific studies of animal life do not document hundreds of millions of animal species, either existing or extinct. These wild extrapolations for the number of animals on Noah's Ark 
are derived from the assumptions of Darwinian evolution and the needed yet missing millions of transitional animal species. Even the seemingly lower figures, ranging from three to 10 million species, are substantially inflated beyond currently observed and cataloged species, which only number in the range of one to two million. Yet for numerous reasons that we will discuss, the number of different animal species on the ark is nowhere near hundreds of thousands, let alone millions. But let's take a moment and allow the Bible to set the boundaries for our discussion concerning the animals on the ark. Prior to the flood, God conveyed to Noah very succinctly and definitely the scope of his plan to bring a global flood on the earth, and that the ark would be a barge of salvation for both Noah's family and constituents of the animal world. And behold, I myself am bringing flood waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. God's plan for the floodwaters was to destroy the pervasive wickedness that had consumed humanity, and in so doing also all flesh in which is the breath of life, such as birds, beasts, and creeping things. Thus the animals that came to Noah to board the ark were representative male and female pairs of only those kinds that would perish in the waters of the flood. On the very same day, Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them, entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, all cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark to Noah two by two of all flesh in which is the breath of life. Once the appointed time had arrived, the animals of each specific kind entered the ark two by two for Noah to quickly settle them into their places, then usher his family inside. Once the appropriate members of all flesh with the breath of life was on board, God closed the single door in the side of the ark and the cataclysmic event ensued. The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward and the mountains were covered, and all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on the dry land, died. After the torrential 40-day rains and the breaking loose of the fountains of the deep, the floodwaters covered all the mountains across the entire earth. And God's plan and preparation for the survival of life was fully realized. When reading through the Bible's account, not only are the general descriptions of land animals given, birds, cattle, beasts, and creeping things, but three times the Bible tells us that the animals that were either saved or destroyed had the breath of life. Thus, when we survey the modern descriptions of the kingdoms of life, the Bible's account only describes life in the kingdom of Animalia. So Noah did not have to take representatives from the kingdom of the plants, or the fungi, or the protists, or the differing types of bacteria. And despite many pages of skeptical critique, Noah did not take any aquatic animals, no algae, barnacles, clams, no fish, sharks, or even air-breathing mammals such as dolphins or whales. According to the Catalog of Life, which is an international database of taxonomy, there are just over one million known species of life in the kingdom of Animalia. However, of the numerous phyla in Animalia, the majority are either aquatic, such as the phyla of Cnidaria, Porifera, Echinodermata, and Bryozoa, or they are composed of creatures that do not fit the Bible's descriptions, such as Mollusca, Annelida, Platyhymenthes. And in fact, over 85% of all animal species are found in the single phylum of the arthropods, which includes over 700,000 catalog species of insects. And although we may think of insects and bugs as being creepy crawlies, they were not required passengers on the ark because they neither fit the definition of the Hebrew word translated creeping thing, or they do not fit the description of having the breath of life 
in their nostrils. The phylum that contains the main classes of animals that do fit the required biblical specifications is that of the chordates. Yet even in this single phylum of approximately 66,000 species, roughly half are in the aquatic class of bony fish, which leaves approximately 31,000 species in four major classes fitting the Bible's description. These four major classes are the mammals with over 4,800 species, the birds with over 9,900 species, the amphibians with over 6,400 species, and the reptiles with almost 9,800 species. These four classes represent the most well-known and studied air-breathing land animals. There's one more well-known group of organisms that we have not discussed, the dinosaurs. This group of extinct animals can sometimes be missed because of the confusion that evolutionary interpretation applies. As part of God's creation, the dinosaurs were absolutely real members of the animal kingdom. Although we do not know how or when each dinosaur kind went extinct, we do know that whichever kinds were alive at the time of Noah would have been passengers on the ark if they had fit on the Bible's required characteristics. However, let's address two major misconceptions. First, we are usually enamored with the largest of dinosaurs, towering over us at museums. The Brachiosaurus, Argentinosaurus, Tyrannosaurus rex, Stegosaurus. Yet these large specimens represent only a small fraction of dinosaurs. The vast majority were actually quite small, and the average size of all dinosaurs was somewhere between a sheep and a cow. And further, this average size is for an adult dinosaur. We are not told in scripture that the animals had to be adults, so God could have easily had younger animals and dinosaurs arrive at the ark for Noah to load. The second misconception about dinosaurs is that there were millions of different species. Just as we have discussed the reasonable numbers of animal species, the number of named dinosaur species is less than 1,000. So we can easily add to our figures 1,000 sheep-sized dinosaur kinds. So far, we have discussed the potential numbers of animals by following the species statistics of taxonomy. The modern definition of the term species can be a very controversial discussion among scientists. But the most popular definition states that a species is a group of individuals that actually or potentially interbreed in nature. In this sense, a species is the biggest gene pool possible under natural conditions. This concept, though, in its current form, has only been around for a few hundred years since the time of Carl Linnaeus, and represents modern humanity's approach to categorizing and studying life on Earth. Although the species is supposed to represent the largest pool of interbreeding organisms, there are many known exceptions to this definition. The term hybrid has been used to define an offspring from parents of separate species. And actually, there are three different degrees of hybridization. Interspecific hybrids occur between different species that are within the same genus. Examples of this include the canine genus, where distinct species of domesticated dogs, coyotes, wolves, and jackals have been known to interbreed. There have similarly been hybrids in the genus of bears, including grizzly polar bear hybrids, seen both in the wild and captivity. Additional examples of interspecific hybrids abound between species of felines, species of geese, species of woodpeckers, gulls, finches, chickens, crocodiles, and many, many more. The second degree of hybrids that we see are intergeneric hybrids, which occur between different species that are also from different genera. Examples of this type of hybrid include members of the bovine family, specifically the interbreeding between the bows genus, which includes yaks and domesticated cattle, with the bison genus, which includes the American and European bison. Cattle-bison hybrids have been observed naturally since the mid-1700s in the United States, and intentional crosses, such as the beefalo, have existed since the mid-1800s. Another example of the intergeneric hybrid includes various members of the duck family, specifically the interbreeding between single species containing the mallard, the bald pate, the redhead, and the wood duck. Other examples of this type include members of hummingbirds, warblers, swallows, and felines like the caracal and serval. Although rare, the final degree of hybrids are the interfamilial hybrids which occur between different species 
that are not only in different genera, but also in different taxonomic families. Examples of this form of hybrid exist between guinea fowl and pea fowl families, between pheasant and grouse families, between the families of ducks and geese, and between the families of sparrows and finches. The important aspect to recognize concerning all of these hybrids is that even though scientists may have cataloged animals into distinct species, which in many ways is valuable, the classification still represents only a theoretical boundary that man has assigned, especially when it applies to potential interbreeding. What this means for our discussion of the animals on the ark is that the numbers of defined species we've mentioned are really upper limits since numerous species may have been represented by a single common pair rather than a pair from every species. This distinction acknowledges that the Bible's use of the phrase after their kind is not restricted to our modern term species, and in many cases probably is equivalent to a higher taxon like genus or family. For our discussion though, we will simply use the species counts as an overestimate of the total number of animals on the ark. In addition to the common two of each kind, God further elaborated that each of the clean animals, Noah would take seven of each kind on board. Though further identification of clean versus unclean is not given in the context of the flood account, the law of Moses has lengthy discussions of the qualifications of clean animal kinds. Using these as a guide, the numbers of clean animal kinds was quite restricted, so we can easily account for the additional clean animals by simply rounding our numbers up. So all in all, here are the total numbers of individual animals. 12,000 mammals, 20,000 birds, 20,000 reptiles, and 13,000 amphibians. Before loading these 65,000 individual creatures on the ark, we need to address a couple of final but key issues. First, to conveniently account for the diversity in animal kinds and sizes, we need to utilize a reasonable average or common representative animal size for each class. This can be done fairly easily using the results from some scientific surveys of animal sizes. If we look at the mammals, we might think about the large creatures, like elephants, hippos, or horses. But the biological surveys have found that the most common mass of an adult mammal is less than 10 pounds, which might sound small, except when we consider that approximately 40% of all mammal species are in the rodent order. An important point to mention here is that there was no requirement for taking the oldest or largest, or even having to take adults. Adolescents or juveniles would have been suitable in most cases. Similarly for amphibians, with approximately 85% of all species being in the frogs and toads order, the most common adult mass of approximately a quarter of a pound is reasonable. Likewise, there are only a few larger reptiles, like the Komodo dragon or crocodile. So the most common mass is also approximately a quarter of a pound. And finally, for the birds, their most common mass is less than one-tenth of a pound. What this means is that for convenience, we will approximate all of the mammal individuals on board the ark to be the size of a juvenile sheep, well overestimating the less than 10 pound size. And for all the numbers of birds, amphibians, and reptiles, we can approximate them to be the size of a medium sized chicken. Again, an overestimate. The second key question to consider is, what were the animal accommodations necessary? How tightly arranged were the animals? The Bible tells us that Noah was to make rooms for the animals and to prepare stores of food, but exact dimensions for the various compartments, pens, corrals, or cages are not given. So engaging the space requirements necessary for the animals on the ark, there are two modern day analogies that we will utilize, modern animal transportation and modern larage or housing standards. It is important to first notice that neither of these two comparisons really fit the ark situation. The ark was not a short-term trip from point A to point B, like transporting cattle from pasture to market. Neither was the ark a long-term environment, like a zoo or research facility. The ark was a survival barge, which carried precious cargo above the flood's waters for a limited time duration. Thus, looking at modern standards for both transportation and housing, simply provides a nice lower and upper limit for the space requirements. So how much space would the animals have occupied? As we have seen, the ark is an immense vessel with a total of over 100,000 square feet of deck space. 
In terms relating to transportation, the arch size was equivalent to the volume of 527 railroad boxcars. When we consider the transportation of animals, the recommended densities for travel have been fairly consistent from as far back as the 1920s in the railroad industry through the trucking industry of today. Using published recommended capacities, a common dual deck boxcar could transport 240 mid-sized sheep. If we assume 12,000 individual mammals represented by sheep, then they would all fit within 50 boxcars. For our smaller animal kinds, a poultry boxcar that contains numerous levels of stacked cages could carry approximately 3,000 medium-sized chickens. If we assume a combined total of 53,000 individual birds, amphibians, and reptiles, then they would all occupy less than 18 boxcars. Thus, using the relative sizes and numbers of known species and the modern transportation standards, the ox animals would only occupy approximately 13% of the total volume, or 68 boxcars, leaving an incredible 87%, or 459 boxcars for food, water, and additional living space. Now, we acknowledge that these percentages are based on relatively short-term arrangements found in railways or trucking. But they also match many seafaring livestock carriers that transfer cattle across large oceans from Australia to the Middle East or from South America to Europe. However, for long-term standards of animal housing, we can utilize the work of Professor Temple Grandin and other animal science experts for the recommendations of animal storage in research facilities. Using the recommended floor space allotments, a mid-sized sheep should have around five square feet of space. Thus, the 12,000 mammals would require approximately 60,000 square feet. The remaining 53,000 birds, amphibians, and reptiles that we are approximating as the size of a chicken would occupy 26,000 square feet at the recommended half a square foot allotment. These numbers result in approximately 85% of the ark's deck space being utilized for the animals. With each deck having roughly a height of 12 to 15 feet, stacked cages for the birds, amphibians, and reptiles, and many small mammals would have been easily managed and would greatly reduce the overall deck space needed and make caring for the animals even more efficient. If the pins and cages for at least the birds, amphibians, and reptiles were stacked only too high, the deck space required would drop by 13,000 square feet, which is quite a substantial amount. Thus, using the modern animal housing standards, the ARC's animals would occupy between 70 and 85 percent of the total deck space, which is 15 to 18 basketball courts, and would leave 15 to 30 percent for food, water, and living facilities, or between three to six basketball courts. Of course, even at the minimum of 15 percent for storage and living, that would mean 15 percent of the ARC's volume since the food stores could easily be stacked into grain bins, barrels, cupboards, water tanks, etc. So 15% of the total volume would be equivalent to a quarter million cubic feet, which is over 79 boxcars or two and a half Olympic sized swimming pools. I know that we have discussed lots of numbers, sizes, and volumes, so let's summarize it. Considering an overestimate of 65,000 animals on the ark, we can easily fit all of the animals on board with room to spare. The reality of the ark's animal accommodations would be somewhere between the short-term transportation comparison at the 15% and the long-term housing comparison at the 85%. If we split the difference between these two scenarios, then a more accurate percentage for the animal space required would be 50% of the total ark. So a good estimate would be that Half of the ark would be taken up by animal corrals, cages, and pens, while the other half of the ark would be living areas for Noah and his family and storage for food, water, and other essentials. Now, our goal has been to focus on the Bible's account in order to understand the reality of Noah's ark and to dispel all of the exaggerations and misconceptions. As we have seen, many of the criticisms of Noah and the ark have no foundation since they have ignored what the Bible has actually outlined. God's instructions for Noah clearly outline the specific kinds of animals that would be on the ark, and that God would bring them to Noah. Despite skeptics who claim that millions or hundreds of millions of animals were required on the ark, both the biblical record and the scientific data firmly reject such a notion. The ark was an immense vessel 
with a capacity perfectly suited for the precious cargo it would carry. Throughout the entire account, it is important for us to recognize God's role. While there were many physical duties that Noah was tasked with accomplishing, and the Bible tells us that Noah did all the Lord commanded him, God also outlined his role in the impending flood. Since God chose the ark as the mode of saving life, and God conveyed the original building instructions to his chosen builder, Noah, and God was responsible for bringing the appropriate animals at the appointed time, then we can clearly see that the ark's structure was sound. Its seaworthiness was beyond compare. Its capacity to accommodate the passengers and cargo was absolutely sufficient. And while Noah and his family woke up each day for over a year on their floating home to live, eat, and work, the Bible tells us that God's providential role continued and that he remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him on the ark. Okay, there's quite a bit here that I think really is, is worth our while of, of looking at and trying to understand the best that we can. I really feel like uh, there are a lot of times that people have uh, abused what they think took place and um, really was not quite what really did take place. Uh, and I, I, I really believe that this video helped us have a much better understanding uh, the World Video Bible School is in Buda, Texas. The people who put this together are our brethren. Uh, Branyan May, I talked to him on the phone earlier this week. He's a, a friend of mine. Uh, he is set to be the new, uh, the, the, eventually the new director of, of World Video Bible School. He has a PhD in astrophysics. So he's a brilliant young man and quite a scientist himself. But uh, this is a good work. I highly recommend World Video Bible School, and uh, it has a lot of values, and you can usually find a lot of good things at very reasonable prices. They're not there to make a big profit. They are there to, to meet their expenses. They're a nonprofit like, like we are, and that's, that's the good thing about it. Okay, uh, we've got about 10 minutes or so before we do. Turn to Chapter 7 of Genesis. Uh, Noah had finished building the ark. A hundred years have gone by. Uh, then the Lord said to Noah, enter the ark and you and all your household for you alone. I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. You shall take with you of every clean animal by sevens, a male and female and of the animals that are not clean too, a male and his female. Also of the birds of the sky by sevens, male and female to keep offspring alive on the face of the earth. For after seven more days, I will send rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded. That phrase to do according to the commandment, according to what the Lord commanded is found from Exodus through Deuteronomy 46 times. But here is the thing that is at the very beginning of it. And this phrase of doing according to the commandment is one of those phrases that really talked about our needing to be very careful and to be specific about what God says to do. Uh, when I was doing a lot of study in these matters, uh, especially with Deuteronomy, Many years ago, in preparation for a book that I was writing called Let All the Earth Keep Silence, and basically it was a, a study that was to be for the basis of why we do not use instruments of music because there was a lot of, well, there was an awful lot of confusion back in the late 80s about these things when I wrote the book. This phrase, to do just as the Lord commandment, when it says, thus Noah did, so he did, those are phrases that go with that just as, so, so he did. And this phrase, according to the commandment, those two things, the phrase, 
uh, to do just as is found 64 times from Exodus to Deuteronomy. And the phrase, in 12 times, by the way, in commandments, and then uh, the other times in examples. And then this one, according to the commandment, found 46 times in that period, but not, not counting what we have in Genesis. But if your mama told you, I want you to do just as you are told 64 times, do you think she meant it? <laughs> Do you think God meant it if he said that 64 times? And see, that's the whole point, that we're not to add, not to take away, not to do our own thing, not to initiate. We are to do just as the Lord commands. And this all finds really its basis back, way back in the days of Noah. That's where the very first time we see these phrases. Uh, but we will see them again in a lot of the things about the making of the tabernacle, and many other things that relate to the temple uh, or the tabernacle and, and to the Levites as they began and uh, much of it in the covenant. Yes, ma'am. Even Moses, and I always felt bad for Moses because he was dealing with some hard-headed folks. Mm -hmm. God told them to speak to the rock. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And he disobeyed. And as yeah. a result, he did have the opportunity of entering walking. Yeah. When he took his own initiative to strike that rock, the, the second time water came forth, you know, that's when, and he also made the statement when he did that, shall we bring forth water? He was arrogant. You see, whenever you began to be arrogant, you do things that God has not asked you to do. That is presumptuous. The reason why I am opposed to instruments of music in the worship of the church is because it's presumptuous. It's presumptuous. We're presuming to be able to do something we have no right to do and we have no authority to do. And uh, uh, Nadab and Abihu were presumptuous. Uzzah, when he touched the ark, was presumptuous. Uh, one of the best examples can be found in 2 Kings chapter 16, beginning in about verse 9, where you have uh, Ahaz, the king, and he went up to Damascus and he saw this... Uh, it was a uh, kind of a, an altar that they were using up there, and it was very highly decorated. And he liked that altar so well that he got a drawing of it, and he sent it down to the priest and had the priest make an altar like the one up in Damascus. It says that he moved God's altar to the side, and everybody else was to use this new improved altar and he said, well, whenever I want to call upon God, I'll, I'll use God's altar. He didn't let anybody use it but himself. Well, that was presumptuous. And Hezekiah destroyed all the things that Ahaz brought in. We find that out a little bit later on. Now, that's a great example of, okay, you add your own instrument. You're doing it on your own. You may think it's a good thing to do. You may like the way it looks. You may like the way it sounds. You may think it's all that great. But God told us what he wanted us to do. Let's do what God says to do. And not add to it, not subtract from it, not change it. God doesn't need an editor. And uh, if you ever want a copy of my book, Let All the Earth Keep Silence, I'll be happy to send you one. Uh, call the search office. They'll send it to you. They'll ask you for $5, but that goes to search. It doesn't come to me. Or if you want it in an e-file, I'll send it to you in an e-file. I need to, I think it's one of those books we'll probably publish in Kindle form later on because it needs to be out there still. There have been a lot of young men since the late 80s that have finally understood why we don't use instruments of music, young preachers who were taught otherwise in some of our schools. And uh, okay, that, that, enough of that. Verse six, now Noah was 600 years old when the flood of water came upon the earth. He was 500 when his, his children came along, but now he's 600 years old. Uh, whenever the waters come on the earth, Noah and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him entered the ark because of the water of the flood, of clean animals and animals that are not clean and birds and everything that creeps on the ground. There went into the ark of, uh, to Noah by twos, male and female, as God had commanded uh, Noah. It came about that after the seven days that the water of the flood came upon the earth 
in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, you know how specific he gets. If you'll notice, I have a little chart uh, and a few more pages that deals with all of these times. I think the next page, 55 and 6, talks about the specific dates when all of these things took place. The seven days goes by, it's in 600 year. On the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were opened. The rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, Noah's wife and the three wives of the sons with him entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind and every bird after its kind, all sorts of birds. So they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh in which there was breath of life. Those that entered male and female of all flesh entered as God had commanded him and the Lord closed it behind him. Then the flood came upon the earth for 40 days. The water increased, lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth and the ark floated on the surface of the water. The water prevailed more and more upon the earth so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. Verse 20, the water prevailed 15 cubits higher and the mountains were covered. So every, the whole earth was nothing but water. 15 cubits, that would be uh, 22 and a half feet. 22 and a half feet. Uh, the highest point on the mountain would still be 22 and a half feet below the water. And all flesh that moved on the earth perished, birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind. Of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath of uh, the spirit of life died. Thus he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land from man to animals to creeping things and the birds of the sky. And they were blotted out from the earth. And only Noah was left together with those that were with him in the ark. The water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. Now, if you look at the chart on page uh, 55 and 56, it gives all of these specifics about what day the water started, how long it was there. And you'll notice that actually there was a period of time that was a little over a year uh, that they were on the ark. The total time in the ark, 370 days. And uh, I thought this was quite an interesting chart to put in here. And a lot of the things that we look at, the sending out of the doves, all of the other things that takes place in, uh, in the chapter is all mentioned in how the ark would rest on the uh, mountains of Ararat after the waters prevail. Uh, all of those kinds of things. But here was, uh, here was the situation that the, the ark was there and how it floated and how it came down and how the Lord was behind it all and helped them and was with them. Now, after that period of time, God remembered Noah. Now, it was not that he forgot Noah, but now he was going to, it was time for him to do something. That's what the word remember sometimes means. You know, you have that situation with, uh, with the time of Moses that God remembered Israel. Well, it was the right time. We don't know why God chooses certain times, but he has his own wisdom. And he acts in his own, time, his own time, not in our time. He does things his own way, not in our way. And there are times when patience is really, really important. And so this is kind of where we are, are at. Okay, we, uh, we have been at this quite a little while. Let's see. Did, we started, what, at 10 after? Or did we, when you call, maybe 15 after? Let's, let's go a little bit farther. And then we'll we'll stop. Yes. The days of the week, Sunday, Friday, Wednesday. All these things. Is that where'd you get that from? Or where's that coming from? The days of the week. 
that's that's how we would describe it. It would not be in the text. That's how we would describe it as the first day of the week. There was already weeks going on from the time of creation. There would be the first day of the week and the seventh day of the week would be, of course, the Sabbath. So uh, this is just our, all of that is, is, is a modern thing, not, not something that would be ancient. That's something that helps us to understand when it was because we use those words, which was the Roman calendar. And uh, some of those things, of course, were about Roman gods. Saturday would be after Saturn. Sunday and Monday, the sun and the moon and the others. So really, I don't much care for those, but that's what everybody understands. And we'd be in a world of hurt if we were trying to ch change the name of every day of the week. And we'd be in a world of hurt these days. Uh, even if we could do it, we couldn't get everybody else to do it. So uh, it's something we're kind of stuck with because that's our culture and our time. It talks about also the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed. That period of time came when he closed them. The rain from the, from the sky was restrained. And the water receded steadily from the earth. And at the end of 150 days, the water decreased. In the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. Now, Ararat is a mountain range, not a specific mountain, but a mountain range. And while there are people who say they have found the ark on the side of this mountain or that mountain, maybe, 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 I don't know. I don't know. My faith does not rest on what somebody says they found in the, in the, in the ark or in the shroud of Turin or other such things. Yeah, yes. You know... The part where it says um, the deeps were closed, mm -hmm. it makes me, when I was a kid, it made me think about the Mariana tra Trench and how like, there's that portion of water that no man has, can't even pass through because it's so dense, so deep, so it's like a door over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what your opinion of that would be. I hadn't really thought about it. I don't have an opinion, <laughs> to be honest with you. I really haven't thought about it. As far as the density of the water, if that's the door, that's never that's never occurred to me. I guess I've just not uh, I've not really ever thought about that. I do know that the farther down that you go in water, the more dense that water becomes, and and the weight of that water above you it gets more and more. Uh, this is why whenever you have people who dive and uh, they get the bends on the way coming up, they come up too quickly because of the amount of weight against their body when they're far down and then they come up uh, too quickly and all of a sudden the weight is less and less and it creates a problem for them. So I, I, I haven't really thought about that. That's a great question, but one I've never pondered. Um, but, you know, this is, a, this is a huge thing. You can imagine what all this must have done uh, Answers in Genesis put out a video uh, detailing the uh, the things that the flood did to the surface of the earth and all of the changes that took place with the uh, various things that took place, the, the cutting of, uh, uh, they showed uh, the Grand Canyon and some of the things that were there and how that canyon was not cut in millions of years, but it could have been cut in a very short period of time if you had a cast in the clip cataclysmic event. The flood was cataclysmic. It was far more than just water filling the earth. There was a great deal. You think about that water coming in and that water going out, and you could have had rivers and stuff all of a sudden flowing to various things. Out in uh, Oklahoma and, and West Texas, there is a water table below the earth, as there is much places all over the earth, a water table where water is stored. And, of course, uh, many of these great uh, areas are stored there because of the situation where they irrigate. They irrigate thousands and thousands of acres of land out in West Texas and western Oklahoma. You fly over that part of the country and you'll see all these circles. Well, what that is is somebody's pumping that water out and irrigating in, within that circle. 
And uh, you'll see a bunch of those when you, when you get there. And that water table is there. Well, that water table is not just there. It's everywhere. You know, you can, you can drill a well uh, even in, in very arid places and find various water that's stored beneath the earth. Uh, it's hard for me to believe, you know, there is so much water. You think about the oceans and how much there is of that. We don't know how much of the earth was lifted so that the dry land could appear again. You know, once that water had receded, uh, there's also water in the clouds, in the firmament. There's always water in the clouds. So it's, there's a lot of things that have changed since that time. And uh, rain, of course, was taking place at this time. And there was things that they saw that they had not seen before. First mention of rain is now here in Genesis 6. So there are a lot of things that take place in that. Uh, Answers in Genesis put out a film that uh, where some scientists were talking about the way the earth was shaped. Uh, YouTube has this. You can see it free. You don't have to order it. I have a copy of it, but I can also see it on YouTube. And it's really quite an interesting thing. And I would urge you to take some time to look at the things that have to do with the flood uh, in some of the answers in Genesis, some of the things that they have put out. Uh, YouTube is a good place to put it. Uh, YouTube is a tremendous resource of an awful lot of things. Some of it ridiculous, but some of it very, very good if you if you want to take the time to look at it. Uh, but I did want to mention about the mountains of Ararat. It's not one mountain, but a mountain range. And we just don't know. I, I don't, you know, is the Shroud of Turin, some people, oh, it's, it's authentic, the Shroud of you know, if you look at what's said in John and other places, Jesus was wrapped. His body was wrapped. I don't know about a shroud. His body was wrapped. And it even talks about the headpiece that was folded. Uh, but his body was wrapped. It wasn't, it wasn't in a shroud like they would have. So, I, you know, I, I don't know how it came about. I don't think about it. I don't know whether it's authentic, not authentic. My faith does not rest on whether or not the shroud of Turin is there. My faith rests on the Word of God, uh, on the Bible, and the, the things of the Bible. Uh, when I was dealing with that, I guess it was two or three years ago, one of the things that was so interesting to me was the Bible is the only book in existence, ancient or modern, that has specific, exact predictions of things that would take place hundreds of years in the future that came to be true. Uh, Nostradamus is not in the same category as the Bible. <laughs> and uh, we, you know, I talked a little bit about the crucifixion. Uh, was it here? I, I've spoken so many times I forget what I've said where. But Psalm 22, verse 16, maybe it was at dinner, where you have, uh, where you have the piercing of the hands and the feet. Uh, Psalm twenty-two, sixteen. 16. David wrote that a thousand years before Christ. What is so interesting is that crucifixion as a way of uh, punishing people did not begin until the 6th century among the Babylonians. The Greeks learned it from the Babylonians and the Romans learned it from the Greeks. Now here is a prediction of a way that someone was to die that wasn't even thought about for three, four hundred years, and he predicted it a thousand years before it happened. The gambling over the clothes. Uh, various other things found in Psalm 22, which is one of the most messianic of the Psalms. Psalm 2 and Psalm 22 are very messianic, and David is called a prophet. And so uh, it's really quite interesting to think about those kinds of things. Uh, and some of the things that are like the Bible is just that's where my my faith is, because no other book has the kind of thing that the Bible has. And if the Bible has that, then that's proof that God predicted it. And there has to be a God because of it. Uh, somebody had mentioned to me, I guess it was Daniel yesterday, that he had written uh, that he had read a book that I had one chapter in called The Utterance of God, The Utterances of God published by the uh, Warren Christian uh, Apologetic Society. Uh, 
Yeah, it's the Warren Apologetics, uh, WCAC, Warren uh, Christian Apologetics uh, Company up in Parkersburg, West Virginia. Uh, Charles Pugh is the director, good, good man. And he asked me to write a chapter on the inspiration of the scriptures. And one of the things that uh, was quite interesting in that book was a defense of the existence of God based upon the miraculous things that are in the Bible. The fact that you have uh, so many things in the Bible that it can really be understood and appreciated. I have great confidence that if the Bible says it, it's true. Old Testament or New Testament. Yeah. That it was a real event. And what we have here happening is a real event. We don't understand fully all the things that were done. God doesn't tell us everything. And we have to sometimes live with that. But what he does tell us is so significant and so amazing uh, that he has told us the things that he has about the flood. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. Okay, the water is beginning to come down. And uh, it came about at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made. He sent out the raven. It flew here and there until uh, the water dried up from the earth. And then he sent out a dove. The raven apparently didn't come back. Uh, but he sent out a dove from, from him to see if the water was abated from the face of the land. But the dove found a resting place for the sole of her foot. So she returned to him into the ark, for the water was on the surface of all the earth. Then he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark to himself. He waited another, yet another seven days. And again, he sent out the dove from the ark and the dove came to him toward evening. And behold, in her beak was a freshly picked olive leaf. Now that's where the idea of peace and an olive leaf comes from. That's where this comes from. It was a sign that uh, things had begun to return to normal. Don't you wish we had somebody bringing us an olive leaf today and things could be back to normal? Well, there it was. Uh, you have the olive leaf. And then you have another seven days, sent out the dove. She didn't return to him again. So... The dove didn't see the need to return. Now it came about in the 601st year, in the first month, on the first of the month, that the water was dried up from the earth. And then Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the surface of the ground was dried up. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. So there did come that time when the earth was dry. And uh, you have the dove with the olive and then doesn't come back. Then God spoke to Noah saying, go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your son's wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may breed abundantly on the earth. Now, they apparently were large enough to breed. They may not have been full grown. Yes. Sorry, one of the questions online was, uh, uh, we read it. are we able to elaborate on the thought that Noah did not know of rain until God said he would cause it to rain within seven days? We, I don't really know how to answer that question other than to say th the first time we have rain mentioned is with the ark. And so apparently rain was not known prior to that time. That's 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 the only thing that I the only conclusion I can draw, but that's an inference that we draw from the fact that rain is not mentioned prior to that time. Yeah. Uh, so they have come out. I want you to see verse twenty. Now, can you imagine? Here is Noah. He's been trapped in this ark for over a year. And he's been with all of these animals and his family. And don't you know that by that time, that close to that year was getting there, there was a lot of grousing going on. You know, I, I'm ready to get off this thing. It's time for us to, you know, and uh, now they finally come out. Verse 20, 
Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. And he took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and he offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now you think about every clean animal and every clean bird. That would have been an awful lot to offer. Now, of course, there were seven pairs of those. But he doesn't, he doesn't do this. These are burnt offerings. He doesn't eat these. These went to God. These were totally given to God. I think that is so incredible that he did this. Uh, and the Lord smelled the soothing aroma. And the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. That's the promise that he made. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. That was set over 4,000 years ago. And you know what? You can set your watch and you can look at your calendar and everything's still the same. Okay, we'll stop here at this point. I want to talk about the rainbow, and then we'll begin to do some other things uh, after our break. But we'll stop for just a little bit, and then we'll try to use the last, let's just take five minutes if we can this time, and then that way we'll stop at noon. Uh, when it hits noon, we'll stop. Okay. Fine. And uh, uh, even the best people sometimes have the, uh, struggles and challenges in their lives and uh, Noah was certainly uh, no exception uh, he grew up and was living in a world up through this time that was terribly terribly sinful and uh, I think Noah was a man who found favor in God's eyes and he was called a righteous man and so there were many good things about him but uh, in this chapter, we, we'll see some things that are good and some things that are not so good. Uh, chapter 9 is where we'll start of Genesis. This is on page 61. And uh, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That's a reminiscent of what God told Adam and Eve back in Genesis 1. Be fruitful and multiply. And, of course, the animals were told to be fruitful and multiply. That, that uh, was the other thing. But look what he says about mankind at this particular point. The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and of every bird of the sky and everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are given. Now, he gave that right to Adam and Eve that they would rule over the, the earth, over the animals, but now it's repeated. So you have a second time uh, that it, this is mentioned. Uh, terror would be there. Now, verse 3 gives us something that is new, uh, at least in some senses. He says, every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. So now here is where meat can be eaten. Uh, meat can be eaten. Uh, apparently before this time, there was clean and unclean already mentioned. And so apparently uh, that was understood that of the food that they were to eat that would be meat, it would be of the clean and not the unclean. Yeah. But that transition to then to they no. to eat meat eventually meat because they yeah. had that's why one reason why it's the, the sheep the, the sheep and the cattle. It was for not only for the for the skins or for the birds, but not for the milk, but also for the milk, milk was a product that would have been and they would consume that that would have been uh, a meat product, meat product. 
Well, that's certainly right on, on target with those things. Um, there is a passage that I think is well worth looking at. First uh, Timothy chapter 4 and verse 4. Now, I like catfish. Catfish is an unclean meat, but I like catfish. And I like pork. It doesn't matter whether it's ham or sausage or bacon. I like pork or pork chops. But the pig is an unclean meat. Is it all right for us to eat unclean meat? Now, Mark chapter 7, verse 19 says that Jesus declared all foods clean. Yes. First Timothy 4 and verse 4, uh, or verse 3 he talks about men who forbid marriage, advocate abstaining from foods which God created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude, for it is sanctified by means of the Word of God and prayer. That means we can sure eat bacon if we want to. <laughs> Uh, I, I just wanted to kind of mention that because I think it's important for you to be able to say, okay, there are some passages in Scripture. You know, there are some Sabbatarians, people who still believe the Old Testament is in force, who will not eat anything that's pork. And uh, they will bind that on their families. We know we can't eat bacon. We can't eat that. And those are all unclean. But the fact of the matter is, my Bible says that everything created by God uh, is, is for us. And uh, it's sanctified by means of the word of God and by prayer. And I sure am glad. Just, just thought you'd want to know that. <laughs> okay, every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Now, this was something that was from the very beginning. You remember in Acts 15, somebody asked me not long ago about not eating blood or the things that were strangled because the blood was still in it. Uh, that's something that apparently because the life is in the blood uh, has always been true. It was true in the patriarchal time. It was true. The book of Leviticus, I think it's chapter 17, talks about this as well, about the blood. Uh, 1711 of Leviticus says that the life is in the blood. And really, this is kind of an echo uh, that is here uh, with its life, that is, its blood. And that is something that God has always has always to every nation, to every time, said, you don't do, you don't eat blood. And you don't eat flesh that's full of blood. You, you drain it off and then, then you eat it. So that's something that I think is important to remember. And uh, we were studying Acts 15 in one of my classes not long ago uh, at church. And they were asking, well, why is that there? I mean, they could understand idolatry. They could understand sexual immorality, but they couldn't understand this one. But this, from the beginning of time, has always been wrong. Now, there are those who talk about uh, a blood transfusion, but that is not eating blood. It's a different thing. Uh, it's different altogether. And so I, I would not make one into the other. There are people of this world that do uh, drink blood. Uh, and that's, yuck. Now, next time you cut your finger and you do, do like that, you need to think about that. <laughs> I'm sorry. But he says, uh, the life is in the blood. You, you, only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Uh, surely I will require your lifeblood. From every beast, I will require it. And from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, that's what he's talking about. By man, his blood shall be shed. Uh, Jesus said another way, you know, the ones who take up the sword will die by the sword. Why? For in the image of God, and we talked about that, uh, I think, uh, 
it was either last night or the night before, talked about what it meant to be in the image of God, I think last night. He made man. And because we are made in the image of God, to take a life is, is, is certainly terribly wrong. Uh, as for you, be fruitful and multiply, populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. He, he mentions this again, and he talks about various things. Then uh, God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, Now behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you and with your descendants forever. By the way, we're descendants of Noah. We're descendants of Noah. Every person alive in the world is a descendant of Noah. And uh, with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that comes out of the ark, then every beast of the earth, I establish my covenant with you, and all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood, neither shall there be uh, again be a flood to destroy the earth. That's the promise of God. And you'll remember that's mentioned in 2 Peter chapter 3, that the world would not be destroyed by the waters of the flood, but it would be destroyed by fire at the end of time. It's reserved for fire, and, uh, but the flood was there. And this is the sign of the covenant. There's something you can see that will remind you of this promise of God. Here is the sign of the covenant, which I'm making between you and me and every living creature that is with you for all successive generations. And that includes you and me, doesn't it? I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth and the bow, that the bow will be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant. This was to remind us, but also to remind God. Now, God doesn't need to be reminded, but it is something that will call it to his mind. That's what this word remember means. Not that he had forgotten it, but that it will be a reminder. I'll remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. Never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the cloud, then I will look upon it. See, you're not the only one that looks at a rainbow. God looks at the rainbow too. I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. I do not think it too bold to say that there's probably a rainbow every day somewhere in the world. And probably more than one. I have seen as many as three rainbows at the same time. Many of you have probably seen two, and maybe some of you have seen three, but I have seen as many as three where they would just be kind of stacked with each other. I've not seen more than that. Did you have a comment? Yeah. What's really fascinating is that a bow usually means a circle, right? And when you look at a rainbow through a waterfall, it's a perfect circle. Mm. It's like a, an example of its perfection. You look at it. Mm -hmm. Well, I always wanted, you know, that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. <laughs> I'm sorry. I love your heart. I'm sorry. <laughs> but you're right. It is a circle. And, and uh, that's what makes it a, that kind of thing. And it's, it's a wonderful thing. And it's a beautiful thing. It is, it is kind of sad that this day and time people have taken something that was from God that was beautiful and was a promise and turned it into something that uh, makes them feel better about themselves but actually uh, is, is something that is by nature a, a behavior that is sinful, and that's unfortunate. Uh, to the pure, all things are pure. But those who are not pure, even things that are good and right, can be turned into something that's not pure. Uh, Titus 1 and verse, I think it's about 15, talks about that idea of purity. 
And sometimes people make a mistake about those kinds of things. But God wanted this to be something that reminded everybody of a promise that he had made that was good and right. And so he has this sign of the covenant. This is the sign of the covenant. That I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Now, you'll notice that in this chapter, you've got certain themes that are repeated continually. The destruction of all flesh by water. And now the sign is mentioned a second time. I, he was trying to make a real point to uh, Noah and to his sons. Uh, that's going to be this sign of the covenant. Now the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah. And from these, the whole earth was populated. So we have this beautiful scene that is here. Uh, the beautiful promise in chapter 8. Uh, the promise that uh, seed time and harvest, summer and winter, day and night will not cease as long as the earth uh, stands. Verse 22. We also have uh, that statement about the nature of man that we had talked about. Uh, and we talked about total depravity back after chapter 3. Uh, and how man's intent was, of course, uh, to do evil from his youth. But that doesn't mean he was born evil. It means that uh, he begins to learn it, begins to want it for himself, and he does things he shouldn't do. But nobody was made evil, and we talked about that at length. And I, I just wanted to, to reiterate those two ideas that came from this. But here was a situation where some wonderful thing took place. First, you have this wonderful altar a burnt offering meant that none of it was eaten that it was fully consumed for god that was really quite something that noah did and now we have this situation where god makes this promise to noah and makes a covenant really this was quite an outstanding period of time i'm glad that god did not rush through telling uh, that that noah and that story at the end of it was not rushed through but here we have a dark picture taking place from verse 20 forward that uh, uh, is, is rather sad uh, because of, of what takes place. But it does set the stage for an awful lot of things that will be taking place later on. Let's remember that, no, that Moses was writing these things and many of these things that are being told to us, even though they may seem like, well, why are, why are they saying these things? Many of these things that are being talked about were being talked about because of the situation that would take place years later with Moses and the children of Israel and how they would be taking the land of, of Canaan. And you remember that the people that are being addressed are the Israelites coming out of Egypt in that 40 years of wandering, and now they're getting ready to go into the land of Canaan. And we need to know who Canaan is. and why, why would Canaan be looked down on? What would be the problem there? And we have to remember the Israelites, Abraham and the others were the sons of Shem, not Canaanites, not of the Ham, tribe of Ham and the family of Ham, but of Shem. And so the difference between the two and even to this day, you've got all of these things that take place with Abraham and some of the others that he was around, uh, the family of Lot, the families of Esau, and how there is to this very day still all of this rumbling and hatred and fighting and all of these things between some of these, these tribes. And the book of Genesis really is very helpful in helping us to understand what was the basis for all of this so long ago? But what I can understand is why they couldn't just dispose of this and why they can't look at the cross and say, okay, let's be at peace. Let's be at peace. Islam is not a religion of peace. And anyone who knows about uh, Muhammad 
and what he sought to do. Muhammad was an angry fellow who was rejected when he was young. He made much of his money by robbing other people and killing other people. His religion grew because of intimidation and killing with a sword. Those who live under his influence but are not converts to him have to pay terrible taxes and many other problems. Uh, if there was ever a religion that ever began that is more ungodly than Islam, I do not know what it is. And uh, I just want to make it very clear that that group that came out of that part of the world were so confused and know so little, knew so little about God. Islam rejects Jesus as the Son of God. 22 times in, uh, in the Quran, when Jesus is spoken of, he's spoken of as the Son of Mary. He's never spoken of as the Son of God. They do not believe that God could have a son because that makes God, in their minds, doing something that's wrong. Well, the Holy Spirit and God, of course, was the father of Jesus, and Mary was a virgin. There was nothing wrong about the birth of Jesus. But they, they assume that. They do not believe that Jesus was crucified. They believe that somebody that looked like Jesus was crucified. They have many, many errors. Many, many errors. and. Uh, in the world today, there are still many, many people who are enslaved. One third of all the slaves that are in the world today are enslaved people who are Muslims. And they treat them terribly. They treat women terribly. Uh, I think the worst thing that could happen to any woman is to be the wife of a Muslim man. It'd be a terrible situation. When I was in Russia, many of the Russians, uh, the men would beat their wives, and that was a terrible thing. And we tried to teach them better whenever we were trying to convert them. But the Muslims, they do all kinds of things to their wives. And uh, a false statement, sir? What's that? That's a false statement, sir. What's a false statement? What you just said. What did I just say? That Muslims beat their wives. That's actually a false statement. They do have the right to beat their wives. They do not. Unless you fall, because there's actually more than one sect of Muslim. Because of that fact, people always generalize whether there is a sect of Muslims that follow that of the prophet. The prophet says it's okay. I understand that there are Sunnis and there are uh, the Shiites and that there are differences. But the fact of the matter is that from them in their thinking, they do have the right to beat their wives. They do not. Yes, they do. Because yes, they do. I also speak to plenty of Muslims. That yes. There is a false statement. Well, there may be some who do not, but there are many who do. That doesn't mean it's in the book. Well, I think I think you can find it in the book, and that's the reason why some of them do. Well, okay. I, I I can go and research that. I don't have the time right now to do that, but I. I don't think I have made, I do know it takes two women to equal one man in any kind of legal thing with, with regard to that and many other problems that are there. But they are given the, the right by their books. And it's not just the Quran, it's also the Hadith and some of the others that they go to. Some of your sects do go one way and some go another because of the situation, whether or not they want to follow Aisha or they want to follow the, the next caliph. But the fact of the matter is, there are many who do beat their wives even to this day. Yes. It, it may be that he's given the right versus actually uh, applying the rights to your purpose. Yeah, I think you're probably right. But they, the yeah, the reason that, that some of them do it is because they go back to the book, their books. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, with a little time, I can certainly find a, a place where it shows that. I can also tell you right now that I has, it has been said that a man who beats his wife is a man who is hated by Allah. Yeah. Well, that may be so by some who say that, but then there are others who have a, a different view of that. Yes. But, but you have to remember that much of what Allah said was, uh, let me just back up. 
much of what's in the Quran, Hadith, and various other things evolved. And what you have in the later portions and what you have in the early portions differ. You have statements in the early portions that talk about Jews and Christians, and they are very positive. But you have parts of the Quran that was written later in Muhammad's life. And those things came out that contradict what was said early on. And anytime you have, anytime you have that, what you have is an abrogation. It's just like uh, we don't go to the Old Testament to find out how the church should worship. There was that was for the Jews and Christianity and the covenant for the Christians is different than the covenant that was made with the Jews. And in the same way with uh, Islam, you have some statements that were made later that are very harsh towards Christians and Jews that abrogate what was said early on That's in his life. That's stating that there is that one part that does that completely ignores that whole new stuff. They all talk about the Jews and the Christians not being of evil people. And that's what I'm talking about. That's in the early part of what Muhammad wrote. The latter parts deny that. And what I'm saying is that there is a sect that only followed that portion. Yeah, well, there, that's why there's lots of different Muslims. And yes, I, I, I agree with you that there are different sects, but there are different traditions among those groups as well. And some of them do believe in treating their slave, their women slaves, well, any way they want to. And uh, it, that's very common among that group in other countries. We don't see it as much in this country, but in other countries, it is very much that way. Uh, in Afghanistan, it's not the women, it's the boys. It's a terrible, terrible way of life. And I'm not going to all that. But, uh, uh, okay, let's see. We've got Noah planting a vineyard. We've still got 15 minutes. And he drank of the wine and became drunk. And he uncovered himself in his tent. Uh, there are some who want to give Noah a bit of a break. Maybe he did not understand what would happen in the fermenting of the grapes and the fermenting of some of those other things of what it would do to him. Maybe he did understand. Maybe he didn't understand. I don't know. But he got drunk. And uh, this was the beginning of a, of a problem. Uh, he, was uncovered, he uncovered himself in his tent. He wasn't public with it. He was in his, he was in his tent. Well, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took the garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. Now, this shows the difference between Ham, the father of Canaan, and the two brothers. Uh, why Ham didn't do something, I don't know. But we do know that Shem and Japheth did do something, and they treated their father with respect. Nakedness is a, a statement that is sometimes bigger than just not having clothes on. And we're going to have a suggestion a little bit later on in this passage that apparently something more happened than, uh, than what we might think of uh, with just seeing something. Well, when Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. We don't know what that was, but apparently something was done. Now, here it mentions that Ham is the youngest son. Really, the oldest son is Japheth. Shem is second, and then Ham. But actually, Japheth is the oldest of the three. And uh, what's that? Wonder why when we say, you know, it's always you always think of yeah. like Cain and Lord Seth. You know, it, it, it's funny. You know, Israel had twelve sons, and uh, Jacob. Uh, or Israel uh, had Judah to be his firstborn. You had Isaac who had two sons. Esau was born first, but Jacob was the one who was the firstborn. 
you had Joseph who had two sons and uh, Manasseh was the younger of the two, but Manasseh was the one who was the firstborn of Joseph. And it's funny that you have that kind of situation. And, and apparently uh, it's not always the one who's born first, but the one who was to take the leadership of this. But in the case of this, Shem is the one with the promise, but Japheth is, is really the oldest of the three sons. And uh, Ham is the youngest. Uh, that isn't always brought out, but that, that is the case. And I think I have it noted somewhere in my notes here about that. Who's Jacob's oldest son? Jacob's oldest son was Reuben. Reuben, and then you had uh, Levi and uh, uh, Simeon, excuse me, Simeon. Simeon, and then Levi was th third, and then you have Judah. Judah was the fourth born son, but he was given because of uh, Simeon. Uh, Reuben nest with the father's wives. Shouldn't have done that. Simeon and Levi were the ones who took the sword. And when their sister Dinah, you know, got and all that, then they uh, did that on the circumcision part of it. And of course, that's because they were, you know, because of the sword, they were there. It's interesting that while Levi was uh, not made the firstborn, Levi, of course, was the line of the prophets. I mean, of the priests, of the priests. But Judah was the one that the, uh, of course, David would come from and that the, the seed would come from. Too. What happened to Reuben? Reuben apparently uh, slept with one of the, the wives, one of the concubines. And so, so that's why he was, uh, uh, that was. A, if Abraham ever said anything for all those years until eight Yeah. 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 At least not before that. So you have uh, Shem and Japheth. Uh, they did the right thing. But now he comes down, and it's not Ham that is mentioned here at this point. It's cursed be Cain. But, uh, of course, part of it was because of, of, of that, what, that, what involvement Canaan was or Ham was involved in that. We don't know. There are a lot of things that are not there. But uh, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brothers. And he also said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem. Uh, they stayed together. In fact, whenever we look at the table of nations later on, many of those that were of the family of Japheth live very close to those who are the family of Shem. But here you have a situation where uh, Ham uh, is not so far away, but these groups eventually began to go to other parts of the world, other parts of the world. And so let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. And Noah lived 350 years after the flood. So all the days of Noah were 950 years. That makes him among some of, one of the oldest. He lived uh, longer than Adam. And I think there are only a couple that lived longer than he did. But uh, Noah, he lived a long time. We, we're not told whether he had any other sons or daughters or anything else. We just know that he lived a long time. And, but apparently this event, and, you know, there are times when God doesn't tell us everything we want to know. And it probably is just as well. Probably just as well. There's a lot of things that we don't want to know. And uh, uh, here was one of the times where some really bad things take place. We're going to wait and get into the descendants of Noah in chapter 10, which is quite a long chapter with lots of things. Not all of it is going to be as valuable as the rest of it. There'll be some things that we'll, we'll see in there. And there has to be a lot of question marks. Uh, I have several pages with notes that you have uh, and some of the things that relate to that. Uh, it may be that uh, there are some things that we can look at with regard to drunkenness and some other things about Noah's life uh, that we'll look at after the hour, after, the, after lunch. But I, I do think that in, in thinking about these things, that uh, this table of nations, there's just so much that is there that was so long ago 
And many of these things can be confusing. And there are a lot of it. We just kind of shake our head. The only mention of it that we have really is what's found in Genesis. But it is the table of nations. And of course, this gets us ready. We'll look at the Tower of Babel before we look at the table of nations. Because the Tower of Babel has everybody together. Whereas the table of nations has them separated out. So this is one more occasion where he tells about the table of the nations. And then he goes back and says, okay, here's how it all started. Here's why they're here and why they're there. And of course, uh, you also have a lot of time. You know, 350 years has gone by in Noah's life and you've got some other things. We don't know how much time there was uh, in taking place for all of these things, but you've got a lot of time taking place again beyond all this before Abraham. And you, you have to understand that there was just eight people when they got off the ark. And now we've got all kinds of people. And apparently these sons had some sons because we've got grandson Canaan and uh, Ham was the youngest of them. So there probably were other grandsons as well. So how much time this took place? Again, uh, we have to remember that these are hundreds of years and Moses is picking and choosing those events that were most important for that time. Most important for that time. Okay, we'll stop here because it's time for lunch, and we'll start again at 1 o'clock.